So the project has been updated to Unreal 5.5 because I want to show you some things that have been very recently added as of me recording this. And the first and foremost important thing is the new selection method that we have. So if we go into a state tree, you might remember me uh, going through the selection behavior of uh, these nodes. So they choose what child states to run uh, based on some selection behavior. There's a new one. Uh, and this one can let you select it based on a utility score or at random weighted by the utility scores. So let's talk about these selection utility scores because they are added newly in 5.5 and they can really be used to make your state trees a lot more intelligent, a lot more easily. Of course, the state tree that we have here is relatively uh, simple. So there isn't a lot of choosing to do. So most of this is going to be theoretical. So, how do these selection utilities work? They all have a weight and a couple of different selection methods, or a couple of different tests is the way you can think of it. So, uh, just adjusting the weight doesn't really do anything because the weight is a multiplier for the score that they have. So, by default, they don't have any score. So, uh, if I set this to try select by highest utility, and I just set this uh, to a value of 2, for instance, uh, it's not going to do anything because it's effectively just multiplying 0 by 2, which is still 0. Uh, and if it's a tie between them, it just does them in uh, order. It does them in sequence, just like normal uh, select children in order. So what we need to do is we need to add a constant for now. So if we uh, set this just back to 1 for the time being, and we set this to 1 as well, this will now have a constant value, which is just a literal float value. Uh, you can bind this to anything you want, of course. Anything that is uh, float or number uh, adjacent. Uh, but for now, we just set this to a constant value of 1, which means that the waiting node uh, now has a value of 1 with a weight of 1. Uh, the move to node doesn't have anything, so it's going to go into waiting. I've set the waiting node up to transition back to root, so it's always going to be skipping over the move to now. And we can see that because it has indeed stopped moving, uh, but it will still chase me, uh, but it doesn't patrol anymore because it's immediately going from root to waiting to root to waiting to root to waiting over and over again. But we can see if we put another constant in here and we also give that a value of one, now they are tied again, which means that it will operate in order and it will have the patrolling functionality again. But if I then go back in and instead of changing this, which is just a zero to one uh, value, we change the weight of this to be two, you will see that it goes back to immediately going into weight again because they both have a score of one, but this is getting multiplied by the weight of two. So no longer does it walk all over the place again. Now that doesn't really do much. Um, if it is a static value, because obviously you can just set up your transitions that way, this is good when working with dynamic values. So uh, we can do like binding this to a HP percentage, for instance, so that it's less likely to chase us when it's low on HP. So we would uh, make this root instead of select, uh, try to select children in order. We would make this try to select children in highest uh, utility. And we would put a utility thing on here that would represent our uh, enemy's HP on a zero to one scale. Now we can even uh, use a utility uh, selection for the d distance to our target. So in this chase, what we can do, we can maybe uh, make two different types of chases. We can make one that runs toward the player and one that runs away from the player with like an environment query, right? So what we would do is we would just add a uh, child state to this and put all of these inside of that child state and call this um, run to player or run to target more accurately. And then we could add a sibling state to this and this would be run away. And this could do the running away. So when we chase uh, the player, it doesn't really matter because chasing the player is more like sensing the player, the player is nearby. Do we run after the player or do we run away from the player? So we can do that based on selection utility. If we have a evaluator here that would have a float value of our HP percentage. So on a zero to one scale, do we have 50% HP? That would be 0 0.5. Do we have 10% HP? That would be 0 0.1 and so on and so forth. 
Well, that is just with uh, constant values. We can actually interpret values as a float input instead and be a little bit more flexible with them. So what we can do is we can use a response curve that takes an input range and that normalizes to zero to one. So this might be good for a thing like uh, doing things based on distance because your distance value is going to be in the hundreds or in the thousands of units. Uh, but to make them easier to work with, you can say, okay, we are going to uh, normalize this from uh, zero to 3000. And that's then going to normalize down to a zero to one scale uh, that you can more easily use in this curve. So we can say at zero units, we actually have a value of one. So it is going to be weighted fairly highly. It's going to score fairly highly because it is really close to you, which means that it needs to attack or it needs to do something. Uh, but at a value of one, which we can do by just adding another key curve, time is one, and then the value will be zero. Of course, this is just a linear line. You can add in uh, however many like more points you want to make this shape the way you want. Or you can even use a curve asset like any curve asset that you have made and uh, you can just put in here and it will show up as that curve which allows you to have a little bit more control over like the fall off and the um, tangents of your points and theoretically uh, you should be able to even output a value of bigger than one on this i don't think in most situations you really want to do that uh but I don't see any reason that you couldn't if you make a curve that goes up to a value of two or three or five, uh, you would just have a bigger value being outputted by this specific test. So here what we could do is we could have like that inverse uh, linear curve that we had a moment ago. So at time uh, zero, we have the value of one. And then at time one, we have the value of zero. It's not quite a linear curve anymore at this point because it has like extensions working for it. But that means that if we have full HP, this is going to return uh, a value of zero. So it's not going to be weighted very highly at all. But if we have almost no HP at all, it's going to be a lot more. It's going to be valued a lot higher. So if we put that test on here, it will run through the player when it's on high HP. And if we put an inverse of that on the runaway state, what it will do is it will score higher as your HP lowers, which at some point is going to intersect and is going to make it so that it doesn't run toward the player anymore, but it runs away from the player based on those dynamic inputs. Now, of course, to make it a little less predictable and a little less uh, mechanical, what you can do is instead of doing just by the highest utility, you can select them at random based on a weighted utility so that will just turn the utilities instead of a pure selection method of saying this has two and this has one as its score so we're going to always go with this one what it does is it normalizes those values and it says well this one has twice the value of this one so out of a hundred times that we're running this this one is going to show up twice as often as this one so that would be a two to uh, one ratio. So out of three times that we run this, it's going to do this two times on average, of course. It can very much do it 10 times in a row because that's just how statistics work. And it's going to do this one times out of three on average. And then the last one that we have is a enum input. And this one is actually very, very interesting because we can uh, choose what type of enum uh, we're using. The default will be the state tree uh, any enum, which doesn't really do anything. Uh, but we can take any variable uh, that is an enum on our uh, available bindings. In this case, let's say uh, we have the auto-possessed player enum. And we can say, well, when uh, it's auto-possessing player zero, uh, we give it a value of one. But when this thing is set to auto-possessed player one, uh, we give it a value of 0.6 or something like that, right? Uh, for the auto-possessed, that doesn't make a lot of sense, admittedly. Uh, so realistically you would have your own enum uh so we can do something uh like just making a quick enum here for that and let's call this aggression state just to keep with the example of attacking or running away from the player and we can add an enumerator to this and we can say uh this guy is angry or this guy is neutral 
or this guy is scared or anything in between uh, you can add as many states to this as you really would like because again that's just how enums work then we can add that to our state tree uh, character here so we add our uh, emotional state or something like that we'll call it, we'll call it emotion uh, and we call that the aggression state so now that we've added that we can use that uh on here so we have the um emotion variable and we can say well well you're angry uh, you're going to not run away so if you're angry you're going to score zero on this because you're going to be confrontational if you are neutral uh, let's say that we just scored this at 0.5 uh, but if you are scared we're going to score this at for instance one and then of course run two player uh, would have potentially the exact opposite so we can uh, use a enum input here look at the emotion and add three options to that when you're angry definitely we want to run towards you when we're neutral uh, we wanted to weigh a little bit toward running uh to the player so you can uh, either just put this at 0.5 so that it's a tie or maybe at 0.6 so that it outweighs it a little bit if you're doing this just based on higher score this is a good way uh, to make sure that this is picked before this when you're at neutral uh, but in this case putting them both at 0.5 would do that as well because when you uh, pick them based on the score again if scores are tied what it does is it just executes them in order or it picks them in order rather uh, and yeah when we're scared we will set this uh, to zero just keep it at where it is so that would now when we have some code that runs uh, this emotion and sets it to its proper value which uh, we could just do as an evaluator or a global task on the state tree itself as well it will now make different decisions based on that because we can use this selection utility for all that as a little side note uh, because we're in 5.5 uh, anyway now we can also now more easily map uh, vector variables on here so we have this uh, move to state that i made and this has the move to uh, non-ai which takes in a move to location uh, in 5.4 which most of this series has been made in. Uh, this wasn't available yet, but now when we have a bindable vector parameter anywhere, uh, we can use the get actor location uh, function for that, which allows us to put in uh, an actor or like bind any actor. So we can just move to, for instance, uh, the target location or whatever. Of course, we didn't program this task to work with that. So it's like find the way it works. Uh, but for things like distance comparing, that can actually be really quite useful because you can now uh, set up a transition uh, with a condition for a distance compare. And you can just set both of these to get an actor location. And this can just get the actor itself. And then this can get the actor uh, target that we uh, created and check if it is within a certain distance. So what we made an entire uh, condition check for in the previous part or the part before that uh, now is much easier to do with just the default uh, handed tools so that's a nice little update in unreal 5.5 for state trees uh, that you're really going to want to have most of the project files for this series are still going to be 5.4 so it's going to be a little confusing uh, for anybody following along project by project because suddenly you'll have to use unreal 5.5 for this one i'm sorry about that but again this is actively being uh, improved and developed still by epic so features are still being added and a very big thank you to all my patrons you can see them on screen right now if you want to help support the channel or get any of the project files in any of my tutorials there's a link down below to the patreon page to support me or alternatively as a youtube member and of course, an extra massive thank you to my Cave Digger tier supporters, Sergey Thomas, and my Cave Student tier supporters, Oiku and Earl Monsville Erno.